I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical... If you're seeing naked, this, that means you've likely stumbled, bleary-eyed and bedraggled into part two of my ongoing Howling Through Neo-Tokyo series, where I take a deep dive into the chaotic, neon-fueled dynamo that is Akira. Written and illustrated by Katsuhiro Otomo, this manga redefined visual storytelling for an entire generation, melding the worlds of comics and cinema to an extent never before seen. That's why I want to give this series its due justice, and to me that means showing every panel and hitting every beat of this groundbreaking and revelatory work of cinematic storytelling. Before we jump headfirst into chapters 3 through 5, let's take a moment to rewind. In part 1, our hero, Kanada, and his capsule gang found themselves in a mind-bending whirlwind of excitement, explosions, and espionage, all of which revolved around a mysterious child with psychic powers, a runaway friend named Tetsuo, and a military regime that's more secretive than your browser history. As the story unfolded, we witnessed Tetsuo's fiery bike crash and his sudden disappearance that led into the depths of a shady military facility operated by the indomitable Colonel Shikishima. Meanwhile, Kanada, fueled by a thirst for answers, joined forces with a resistance group on the hunt for a child named Number 26, thinking he might be the enigmatic Akira. Along the way, we tagged along through heart-pounding chases, close encounters with military forces, and the revelation of a pill that's imperative to the survival of these psychic children. Oh, and by the way, Canada, the curious rebel that he is, snagged one of these pills for an impromptu chemical analysis that only began to hint at the shadowy operations happening behind the scenes in Neo-Tokyo. A few days pass before Tetsuo arrives back on the scene, but he's not just dealing with your typical post-accident scrapes. Nope, he's got the military breathing down his neck, worried about the raw power simmering within him like a futuristic pressure cooker. This time on Howling Through Neo-Tokyo, we ride a roller coaster of monumental proportions, and I'm here to bring you along for every twist and turn. So stay tuned, fellow sci-fi adventurers, as we plunge deeper into the cyberpunk abyss of Akira. This is Boy Meets TV, and I'll be your guide through Neo-Tokyo's tangled web of dark secrets and psychokinetic wonders. Chapter 3, Number 41 We start in media res. The capsule gang is out on a joyride, but now, rather than the military, the police are in hot pursuit. The cops call them out as driving with extreme recklessness, while asking for another unit to intercept them. Canada orders the crew to split up. Then we get a head-on shot where we see the gang parting like the seas, only to leave a cop car in a confused limbo. The focus then shifts to Tetsuo. It appears he's made a clean break. He revels in it momentarily until a group of unknown riders comes up on his six. Three motorcyclists with clown face masks swarm him, knocking him from his bike. The clowns encircle Tetsuo where he lies. It seems he stumbled into the wrong turf that night, and the clowns are eager to teach him a lesson. One of them lifts Tetsuo from the ground, holding him as the others beat him. Then, headlights and the sound of revving engines cut through the night. It's the rest of the capsule gang, led by Canada. The clowns get on their bikes and attempt to flee. Canada knocks one of them to the ground before he can get away. He then sends the other guys after the fleeing gang while he stays back to deal with Tetsuo and the fallen clown. Tetsuo rises, bedraggled and bloody from the beating. All he wants is revenge. Tetsuo pushes the clown up against the wall before landing a clean straight in the center of the clown's face. He keeps beating the rival gang member relentlessly while the capsule gang members slowly return without a single clown in tow. As Kanada tells Tetsuo to stop beating on the clown, we see him raise a bloody fist in preparation in the very same panel. 
Kanada grabs his wrist to stop him. Are you trying to kill him? Kanada asks. Tetsuo says he is, and slaps Kanada's hand away. I don't take orders from you, Tetsuo says to him. Kanada can't believe what he just witnessed, but Tetsuo just stares him down as he delivers his message once again. He's not backing down, not anymore. We then cut to the next day at the 8th District Vocational School. Colonel Shikishima exits his black sedan, closely followed by two of his flunkies. One of them pleads with him to stay in the car, but the colonel just keeps on his mission. In the crowded cafeteria, Tetsuo sits quietly, while, all around him, the rest of the gang recount the events of the night before. It seems they're all as surprised as Kanada was to hear that Tetsuo grew a backbone and stood up for himself for once. Mr. Takaba then walks in, shouting for Tetsuo. Tetsuo's wanted in the principal's office. Being a hands-on kind of guy, Takaba grabs him by the shoulder and leads him from the cafe. In another part of the school, we come across Kanada as he gets the infirmary door slammed in his face by his girlfriend or maybe his once girlfriend. He can't even figure out what she's mad about, even though he was downright cold to her in the last chapter. He starts walking away, only to be greeted by the looming figure of Colonel Shikishima with Tetsuo in tow. They recognize each other instantly. Kanada flees in the opposite direction, wondering how the colonel found him there. The colonel's men follow in hot pursuit, Without any other options, Kanada plunges through the second story window in an attempt to get away. The men try to follow, but they're too slow. Kanada gets to his bike before they can catch up, and he's out of there in no time, much to the colonel's chagrin. We then cut to the Neo Tokyo skyline, where we see Ryu and another man standing on an overpass. This other man is Mr. Nizu, the leader of the resistance. The men lean against the railing and talk. Mr. Nizu informs Ryu of the importance of the pill Kanada stole. He doesn't know why it's important, just that the military is going to great lengths to recover it. Despite Ryu's protests, Nizu orders him to locate Kanada and, in turn, the special pill. The men then change topics to the Olympic Stadium. Nizu's contacts have informed him that the site will become a covert military installation after the games. Along with that, he prompts Ryu to incite a major incident to start the public outcry against the military that the resistance desires. The end of their conversation takes place over a scene of Canada as he approaches the Olympic Stadium by motorcycle. The scene then shifts to the colonel pounding his desk with his fist as he scolds his subordinates for failing to retrieve the special capsule from Canada. Dr. Onishi arrives in time to watch them apologize meekly. As the doctor updates the colonel on Tetsuo's status, an explosion rips through the darkness over the colonel's shoulder. Right away, the colonel wonders if it came from the Olympic site. Our perspective then shifts to the Olympic site, where we see Kay running away from the blast. As she flees, she finds her path blocked. It's Kanada. He saw the explosion and figured it would be the best place to find her. When the other Resistance members see Kanada, they just see him as a witness to be taken care of. But Kay vouches for him. She convinces the others to allow Kanada to follow them. So long as he leaves his bike behind. Kanada protests, but eventually relents, following them into an underground tunnel system. At the same time, Tetsuo is undergoing intensive testing in the secret military facility. The doctor pours over the test results, surmising that Tetsuo ingested stimulants, the effects of which could be unprecedented in his research on the psychokinesis that Tetsuo has begun to display. The doctor seems to be laying the groundwork for a cautious approach to researching Tetsuo, but the colonel insists that time is of the essence and they should not be worried about pushing Tetsuo in search of the answers that they desire. Meanwhile, hiding out in a secret room behind a billiard hall, Ryu questions Kanada 
about the special capsule. Kanada plays dumb, making up a story about throwing it in the canal. He sticks to his story when pressed, instead trying to angle himself as willing to talk if somebody could make sure his bike is okay for him. Back in the lab, the doctor and his colleagues discuss how aggressively to treat Tetsuo. Dr. Onishi insists on jacking the machine up to level 10, much to his colleagues' disapproval. Outside of the lab, the colonel discusses the explosion at the Olympic site. Every news network has carried a report about the military's covert involvement with the stadium, leading the colonel to believe that a traitor is feeding the media information. The scene then shifts to a vibrantly colored playroom with vaulted ceilings, a skylight, and a ridiculous assortment of toys. Two of the espers, the military's secret, psychokinetically powered test subjects, sit near a train set, looking sullen. When the colonel asks how they're doing, he alludes to the fact that he doesn't want any of the espers to get too excited, indicating that their powers are tied to their emotions. On the other side of the room, Masaru sits next to Kyoko, another esper. She's had a dream, a premonition. Akira will awake soon. The news terrifies the colonel. He declares an emergency, leaving to alert all personnel at once. Elsewhere, Kay is more or less fed up with Kanada, as usual. She does her best to ditch him, attempting to lock him in the room, but she stopped in her tracks. In the hallway, she's greeted by a spectral figure of Kanada in front of her. The figure's clothes are tattered and its expression looks horrified. Akira is all it can say before it vanishes. We get a brief glimpse of Tetsuo being overcome by his awakening powers before we cut to a conference. Around the massive conference table, we see men arguing semantically and bickering pointlessly before Colonel Shikishima cuts in. He slams his fist on the table and lays the stakes on the line. Either they fund his operation or millions will die when Akira reawakens. The scene briefly shifts to Tetsuo being led through the medical facility, complaining of headaches. He says to the doctor that he already has enough trouble thinking so don't go messing with his head, which I thought was pretty funny considering how much experimenting the doctor has already done on him. The scene then shifts to the billiard hall. Inside, a man in a suit does his best to blend in, but the resistance member from chapter one discreetly monitors the man. In the back stairwell, a different resistance member briefs Ryu on the situation brewing out front with the sketchy man. All of a sudden, the skylights shatter. An entire military unit descends through them, guns drawn. Ryu takes cover in the stairwell, drawing his sidearm. The other resistance member attempts to draw his own weapon, but before he can, the military fires on him, riddling him with a barrage of bullets. Upstairs, Kay gets Kanada and attempts to flee as the military searches the facility for him. Along the way, they run into Ryu, who gives Kay a sidearm. He runs off on his own, telling Kay to get out of there and contact him when she's safe. Kay and Kanada make their way into the sewers as the military blasts their way through the facility, hot on their tails. They just barely make it underground before the military can catch them. As Kay and Kanada flee through the sewers, an explosion goes off behind them. The resistance had rigged the entrance to help them get away in exactly this type of situation. Back in the military hospital, Tetsuo uses his powers to unlock the door to his room from the inside. He approaches the guard on duty, complaining of the pain from his headache. The man looks on in terror as he wonders how in the world Tetsuo broke free. The scene jumps to the Neo-Tokyo skyline, where we see Tetsuo looking out on the city menacingly from the rooftop of the military hospital. We briefly catch up to Kei and Kanada at Harukia, where we get this funny bit about Kanada's ears being shot from the explosion. The whole thing is very Archer-esque. What? 
Yeah, ha ha ha, grown-ups. Keep moving your lips without... Ma... Ma... Excuse me. Ma... As the scene plays out, we learn that the bartender is setting him and Kay up with a room to hide out in. When we shift back to Tetsuo, we see him walking down an alleyway, clearly worn out and in discomfort. Headlights appear on the horizon. It's the clowns, and they want revenge on Tetsuo for their last encounter. We briefly cut back to the military hospital, where Colonel Shikishima and Dr. Onishi stand over the mutilated corpse of the guard who was posted outside of Tetsuo's door. Astounded by his power, they decide to dub him Number 41, the newest member of the Espers. One last cut brings us back to Tetsuo, his back up against the wall as a member of the clowns threatens him. You should have killed me when you had the chance, he says, but now it's too late. Chapter 4, King of Clowns Tetsuo's back is against the wall, but he doesn't look concerned. He's more preoccupied with his splitting headache. The clown threatens to make it worse, brandishing a makeshift monkey's paw made out of chain and hex bolts. As he swings at Tetsuo, the bolts go cascading off of the chain, several flying directly into the clown's face. As he writhes in pain, his friends become fearful of Tetsuo, uncertain of what strange powers protect him. Not done yet, Tetsuo puts his new powers to the test, concentrating on the clown's head until he makes it explode with his telekinetic powers. The other members of the clowns are completely shocked and terrified, but Tetsuo's main concern is his splitting headache, not the bloody and mutilated body in front of him. Despite the rest of the clowns being terrified, one of them offers to get Tetsuo what he needs to cure his headache. We then catch up with Kei and Kanada, who are hiding out in a dingy room behind Harukia. Kanada sulks while Kei complains. He then shifts the topic to Ryu. Kei says that Ryu was like a brother to her, which Kanada uses as a segue to make a move on Kei. I gotta admit, Kanada got me with this one. I was so used to him being a dog that I genuinely thought he was acting like a creep here. But it turns out he was using it as a distraction to steal Kay's sidearm. She fell for it as hard as I did, and Kanada ends up escaping with the weapon before locking Kay in the room. We then catch up with Tetsuo as he approaches the clown's hideout in an abandoned bowling alley. We get introduced to the clown's current leader, Joker. He can't believe it when his flunkies tell him that Tetsuo blew up someone's head with his mind. Despite the rest of the clown's outright terror at the presence of Tetsuo, Joker decides he won't be pushed around by a scrawny little kid. Tetsuo uses his powers to send two bowling balls flying into the air. He then sends them crashing down on either side of Joker, demanding the gang get him something to cure his insufferable headache. The rest of the clowns stand around in shock. Next, we cut back to Kanada and Kay. As Kanada does his best to navigate the sewers, Kay tries to extricate herself from the room he locked her in. After some time wandering, Kanada peeks up through a manhole cover, only to realize he's in the wrong part of the Olympic site. He's concerned about the presence of the guards all around him, so he says he better keep it down. And in typical Kanada fashion, he accidentally knocks something over, alerting the nearby guards. Lucky him though, the guards are distracted as the colonel's helicopter lands nearby. Back at the clown's headquarters, we see the gang crowded around Tetsuo. They watch as he downs a whole galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, and laughers. One of the clowns does the math on how much the product Tetsuo just consumed costs, and comes to the conclusion that supplying his needs will be expensive. Tetsuo tells him to shut up and be grateful he didn't kill him. At the Olympic site, Kay does her best to catch up to Kanada while the Colonel and Dr. Onishi disembark the helicopter. Nearby, Kanada is doing his best to remain undetected, but he ends up accidentally kicking a bucket in typical Kanada fashion. This time, he's not so lucky. The floodlights instantly fire up and the guards locate him. He's forced to flee yet again. 
As Kaneda continues his escape attempt, the colonel is notified of the intruder on site. He's generally nonplussed by it, giving the order to exterminate the pest. Nearby, the guards have Kaneda cornered. He looks over a ledge leading to the canal, and he decides to take the leap, plunging into the disgusting water below. Desperate to escape, Kaneda crawls into a pipe, the soldiers in hot pursuit. Rather than follow him down the pipe, the soldiers decide to shoot blindly. Lucky for Kaneda, it's so dark in the pipe that the soldier can't hit the target. Simultaneously, the colonel and doctor descend into a dark and cavernous underground space via a massive freight elevator. Wherever they're going, it must be dangerous, as the doctor informs him he must don a protective suit. Deep underground, a crew of scientists led by Dr. Onishi bring the temperature of a special chamber down to 0 .005 degrees Kelvin, aka a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. Once the desired temperature is reached, the doctor leads the colonel into a sleek metallic room with countless wires and ducts throughout the space, like a futuristic brute system, all feeding to one central metallic half dome. Above the dome's blast doors reads a single word, Akira. As they approach Akira's chamber, the colonel recites an epic soliloquy. What a disgrace! They were afraid, ashamed. They chose to conceal it. They buried the roots of a great civilization, turned their backs on what science had to offer them, and tried to seal away forever the hole they had torn open with their own hands. Back above ground, Kay reaches a spot where they hid Canada's bike earlier. She moves some debris in a canvas tarp to reveal Kanada's striking red motorcycle. Kay deduces that, since Bike is still there, Kanada must have gotten caught up somewhere along his route. Back in the sewer system, we see Kanada trudging through some truly vile sludge. He follows pipe after pipe, unable to orient himself and find a way out. As he rests, he sees headlights cut through the darkness. He's rightfully confused, until the sources of the lights make their way out of the darkness. It's the soldiers, and they're riding top-secret hover bikes. Kanada has his back up against the fence, unable to find a way out. The soldiers pinning him down, he takes his last resort, and pulls the strap. He starts blasting, hitting a soldier and sending his bike barreling into a massive fireball of wreckage. The debris from that blast hits another soldier, sending him flying from his bike. The, that bike then explodes, pushing the man forward through the fence, incapacitating him in the process and creating a hole that Kanada can climb through in search of an exit. He doesn't get far before the final hover bike finds a way into the passage behind him. The bike fires on him, it's narrowly missing. Kanada takes a brief opening to gear up to a dead sprint. Out ahead, he finally sees light. He runs towards it with all his might, only to see that the opening leads to a huge drop off into a massive canal where all the facility's pipes empty. He stands on the ledge contemplating his way forward, when, across the way, he sees Kay wandering a catwalk. He screams for her just as the soldier on the hover bike catches up to him. Kanada instinctually tries to back away from the approaching danger, only to slip over the ledge. He holds onto it, just barely. The soldier flies right over his head and out of the tunnel into that great open space. He hovers in the opening, where he spots Kay on the other side. Just as the soldier begins to feel thankful he can kill two birds with one stone by capturing both Kanada and Kay at the same time, the former jumps into action. Kanada pushes off of the wall with both feet, the force of which carries him out into the opening, where the soldier hovers below him. Kanada adjusts his body in mid-air as he falls and manages to grab onto the bike's landing skids, the force of which sends the bike careening off course. Kanada's hand slips, 
causing him to fall into the water below. Above him, the soldier loses control completely and crashes, blowing himself up in the process. While all that is happening, the colonel decides to depart, but not before one of his soldiers suffers the misfortune of informing him that they've lost Canada, who the colonel refers to as the rat. The colonel dismisses the soldier, ordering him to be certain to catch and exterminate the rat before the night is up. Back underground, Canada emerges from the water soaked, but miraculously unscathed. Kay then leads him out of the maze-like tunnel system that the Resistance use in their espionage. Above ground, they find Kanada's bike, which they need a little help starting up. Once they get going, they cruise without the headlight on, using the Cloak of Darkness to catch the perimeter guard unaware. They fly right past him and out onto the abandoned stretch of highway that connects the new city to the old. And then Kanada ruins a triumphant moment by being unable to contain his warnings. Chapter 5, Cycle Wars. Chapter 5 opens on the exterior of Harukia. The bartender looks all around before locating Kanada, who sits working on his bike. Kanada complains about the bartender's tools, demanding better ones. But the bartender has a different idea. He's sick of Kanada's freeloading so he demands Kanada to clean up the bar before it opened. Kanada doesn't want to, but he's been hiding out at Harukia since the recent run-in with the military, and he doesn't have anywhere else to go, so he's got no other choice. The scene shifts to a low-angle shot of a bridge. Kay stands beneath it, staring out over the water as she waits. Her attention is drawn up as Ryu approaches. They catch up before filling each other in on one another's experiences since they separated. Ryu relays Nizu's suspicions about the Olympic site, stating that the government is pouring phenomenal amounts of money into it. Before wrapping up the conversation, Ryu asks if Kay has learned anything about the pill Kanada stole. Because she hasn't, he orders her to stay with him in case she can learn something, anything about it. Then they part ways. We then return to Kanada, who's gone back to working on his bike. We see him unscrew the gas cap, where a piece of tape and string are shown. He pulls up the string to reveal the special capsule everyone is after. He'd been hiding it in the bike all along. Shortly after this reveal, the rest of the capsule gang enter Harukia. They look glum, which leads to this funny bit where Yamagata can't pronounce the words he's trying to use to describe his emotional state to the bartender. While this is happening, the nerdy fella from the billiard hall walks into the bar and orders a drink. The capsule gang pay him no mind, instead reveling in the news that the bartender lays on them. He knows where Kanada is. Back outside, we see Kay approach Kanada as he works on his bike. They get in a brief argument before being interrupted by the capsule gang, barging through the door to see Kanada. They're so excited they stumble over one another. As they reconnect, we learn that the gang thought Kanada had been captured by the military. They also reveal that Kanada's horniness annoys them as much as it annoys me, and that the clowns have become a real problem ever since Tetsuo took over as leader. They've been going after all the other biker gangs, robbing them and selling the loot for drugs to help ease Tetsuo's pain from his ever-expanding and unchecked powers. Around the corner, the spy from the bar listens in. We see a brief scene of Tetsuo wrecking an unknown biker before cutting back to Harukia. After hearing about Tetsuo, Kanada calls for a meeting with the leaders of all the other bike gangs except for the clowns. They're going to have a showdown with the clowns and he wants the other gang's help. He says it's a matter of principle, that no self-respecting bikers let a gang of junkies kick their asses. The rest of the capsule gang sets off to round up the other biker gangs while Kanada and Kay stay behind. They start arguing because Kay thinks Kanada's idea is stupid which the spy takes as his cue to leave. As he departs, he encounters a shadowy figure before the scene cuts away. We then see the Neo-Tokyo skyline. 
In a tunnel below the buildings, Ryu and Nizu walk. Nizu shows Ryu a military expense ledger, which has an interesting note scribbled in the margin. A single word, Akira. Ryu believes that the ledger ties the military to the Akira project, but Nizu reminds him that the evidence is still circumstantial, and also that the scale of the threat that the Akira project could prove, if actually true, is utterly immense. They've uncovered a deep government conspiracy that allegedly points to the military creating an army of psychokinetically powered children. The scene then shifts back to the alleyway near Harukia, where the government spy was stopped while trying to eavesdrop on the capsule gang's conversation. It's then revealed that the shadowy figure was the same resistance member that Kay rendezvoused with in Chapter 1. He recognizes the spy from his appearance at the billiard hall earlier, so makes an attempt to intercept him before he can relay his stolen intelligence to his superiors. This leads to a scuffle where the resistance member pulls out his sidearm. The spy is faster though, and he stuck the resistance member with a knife before he could fire. The resistance member, determined to stop the spy at all costs, grabs the knife by the blade and plunges it into the spy's stomach. The spy keels over in a pool of his own blood while the resistance member hobbles away. Time then skips forward to the evening of the biker gang's meeting. They've decided on Haruki as a location. As the meeting commences, Yamagata outlines a plan to funnel the clowns into a secluded pier, picking off riders along the way. Somewhere along the line, Kanada is taken aback by someone referring to Tetsuo as a monster. Kanada can't believe anyone could refer to Tetsuo as a monster, but everyone says he's changed since Kanada last saw him. No one can say exactly how, but one of the other gang leaders ominously closes this portion of the meeting by telling the capsule gang to enjoy getting their heads ripped open. Back at the clown's hideout, one of the gang members tinkers with a chemistry set. He's trying to synthesize an incredibly potent drug to satiate Tetsuo's ever-growing addiction. They say it's so pure a single drop would kill a normal human, but Tetsuo's not normal. We cut to a close-up of him. He's in so much pain he's frothing at the mouth. Interspersed with these panels of Tetsuo taking the concoction, we see the capsule gang's conversation at the bar, in which they outright state for the first time in the entire manga that Tetsuo has developed telekinesis. The Tetsuo portion of the scene cleverly shifts to him riding a motorcycle, arms crossed rather than on the handlebars, before cutting back to the bar, where the gang learns that Tetsuo and the clowns initiated their trap. As Kanata sets out to encounter the clowns, Kay accosts him, as usual. Even though she thinks it's a stupid plan, she wants to go along with him. He says it's gang business, but she won't listen. So, while she's inside getting a helmet, he leaves her behind. In the next scene, we catch up with the clowns as they go on a frenetic rampage throughout the city. They come under attack falling prey to the trap that the other gang set up for them. We even see one of the iconic clips from the movie here. As the clowns move through the city, the other gangs pick them off one by one, exactly how they planned. They even manage to take out Joker, even though he put up a little more struggle than the rest. While all this is happening, Tetsuo rides along, hands still resting at his sides rather than on the bike's handlebars, as he maneuvers through the death trap launched on him by the other bikers. When he finally makes it to the pier, he's all alone. But he's soon greeted by Yamagata and a whole slew of other bikers ready to take him down. In essence, chapters 3 through 5 of Akira are a visual and narrative tour de force, showcasing Otomo's ability to weave complex themes of power, identity, 
and societal collapse into a gripping and visually stunning story. Until next time, if you, like me, love all things Akira, manga, anime, and television, please like this video and subscribe to my channel.